okay so yeah so in this lecture let's continue our discussion on quotient groups and normal subgroups okay so yeah okay so one easy observation in case of a quotient group i would say is that yeah i would just state this to be an observation because the proof is quite you know easy so suppose you start with a cyclic group so let g be a cyclic group now obviously uh, you know cyclic groups are abelian right because elements will obviously commute with powers of themselves right so if we choose a subgroup of g in this case then it would precisely be a normal subgroup right uh, i'll all obviously prefer watching the previous two or three lectures on these topics then it will be far more you know understandable okay so what can i say about g mod n so is g mod n cyclic that's that's my question okay first of all n is cyclic right n is cyclic because n is generated by the element x to the power d where d is the smallest element or i should say smallest positive integer such that x to the power d is in but a question is uh, what can i say about g mod n that whether whether it's it's cyclic or not that that's my precise question what should be the most trivial answer in this case or or i should say what should be the most intuitive answer in this case <clears throat> uh see what are the elements in g mod n precisely so it it consists of elements of the form g n such that g is in g right right but any element of g so so suppose g is cyclic um let's say it's it is generated by x okay uh, yeah so this x is this x only so each element will be of the form some x to the power alpha right such that you know alpha is the is an integer let's say but uh, you can obviously justify this fact that x to the power alpha n is nothing but x n whole to the power alpha this follows trivially from the definition of the group operation of a quotient group but then this trivially means that this is generated by x right right okay so quotient groups of a cyclic group are cyclic that's uh, that's that's the precise thing which i wanted to state our main goal today is to prove a very important um yeah a very important proposition you might say or i should say a very important isomorphism of groups okay so we want to show we want to show d8 modulo the center of d8 is isomorphic to v4 okay what's v4 so it's 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 called the klein four group it's called the klein four group so it's a order four group elements of the form this the c so and it possesses such in certain characteristics such that a square equals b square equals c square equals 1 and ab equals c equals ba that's that's this group is abelian okay similarly bc equals a equals cb and ac equals b equals ca so these are the properties which these elements follow and this forms the klein four group 
okay moreover any uh, order 4 group is isomorphic either to z4 or to v4 we are going to need this proof right in in this while while showing this very statement quick recall what is that what is the group d8 so it consists of all the rotations and reflections maintaining symmetry for a regular four sided polygon so it consists of rotations one r r squared r cubed appropriate rotations they are along with a reflection s and rotations along with reflections in the form sr sr squared and sr cubed okay got it so what are the you know typical properties of these elements if you carefully observe we can also write it as it's an element uh, it's it's a set uh, sorry i should say it's a group it's a group uh, generated by two elements r and s uh, so R represents the rotation and S represents the reflection such that R cubed uh, R to the power 4 is 1 that is if you rotate a certain vertex uh, you know 4 times for example say anti-clockwise uh, maintaining symmetry obviously or you can think of each rotation to, to be just moving a vertex to its next corresponding vertex anti-clockwise sort of like that so if you do it four times you will eventually reach the position you started with if you reflect a certain uh, vertex along a certain line of symmetry twice you will reach the same position you started with and rs is sr inverse that that is if you choose some vertex you rotate it once then you reflect it then it's same as reflecting it once and rotating it in the opposite direction opposite direction to r so if i choose uh, the rotation r to be rotation anti-clockwise then r inverse will be the rotation okay one one rotation clockwise okay so yeah what is what are the elements in the center of d8 so in some previous lecture when we were discussing about centralizers normalizers and centers we had come up to the fact that the center of d8 consists of only two elements it's one and r square so my question is what are the elements in z mod uh, d8 mod z8 let this be written as z itself okay so what are the elements in d8 mod z so i claim the elements are just one bar r bar s bar and r s bar like uh, obviously so one bar is typically one z uh, i shouldn't use this one z r bar is r z um, s bar is s z and r s bar is r s z now how can you say these are the only elements so the the obvious procedure you will follow at this moment because we don't have enough tools to be sure uh, you know you know in, in some shorthand form so you can just check what are the only possible left cosets in this so you choose each element of d8 you form its coset with this set from the left coset with this set and you can uh, you know come up with the conclusion that these are the only possible left coset distinct left cosets okay. for example if i talk about say r cubed uh, what can i say about r cubed uh, the left coset with respect to r cubed okay then this will contain the elements r cubed and r to the power 5 but r to the power 5 is nothing but r but observe that this is nothing but r z right so r cube is the same uh, you know it, it is the same representative of this coset, right so this will do right so in, in in a similar way you can check that the only left courses are these four elements okay one more sort of a conjecture you can you know kind of come up from here is that in case of g mod n the order of this quotient group is nothing but mod of g upon mod of n because the center carries two elements and the group carries eight elements so the quotient group is carrying four elements 
we will obviously counter this while when we will be studying Lagrange's theorem but for now let it let it be a conjecture okay so yeah so therefore d8 mod z is a is an order four group okay so therefore let me just represent it as g so g which is equals to d8 mod z is of order four precisely right and i claimed something just before writing this statement that any group of order four is either isomorphic to z4 or isomorphic to uh, v4 right. the first question is that uh, so so let us first prove this statement which i am telling that um, any group of order 4 is isomorphic to yeah so it's isomorphic to z4 yeah correct z4 or v4 okay how do we prove this statement okay um what we can do is that we know that any cyclic group is iso you know any any cyclic group of order n is isomorphic to zn right therefore if g is a group of order 4 uh, and there exists a non-identity element in G such that the order of it is 4, then precisely G must be generated by this element. But then G is a cyclic group of order 4, so it must be isomorphic to Z4. So our claim is that if G has no element of order 4, then G must be isomorphic to V4 okay so let g have uh, no lg has no element of order 4 okay clear now from here the concept comes out to be very obvious why is it so so if g has no element of order 4 suppose i choose a, an arbitrary element from g okay let 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 uh, small g be an element from g then we know that 1 g g squared and so on till g to the power n minus 1 if if order of g is some n then these are all distinct elements are all all distinct elements okay but we are saying that g cannot have any element of order so in a way from here it's obvious that the order of any element in g must be less than or equals to the cardinality of g but that means the order of any element in capital g must be at least 3 so order of any element in g sorry it as at most 3 is at most 3 okay okay so so we are obviously assuming that g is a non cyclic group precisely and g has obviously g has no element of order 4 so i can just structureize g as 1 a b c let's say okay now uh, so 1 uh, a b and c are non identity elements and they are individually distinct as well now since a and b are in g a b must also be in g right by closure because g is a group now can a b be one that's the first question can a b be one we will answer that later can a b be a now a b cannot be a because 
uh, that would uh, imply that B is one because but but we have chosen B is a non-identity element. Similarly, A B cannot be B as well because that would imply A is not uh, A is an identity element. But that's not also you know what we have here. Therefore, if this does not happen as well. Then A B must be equal to C, and that's our exact claim. Okay. So can A B be equal to one? If A B equals one, then that would imply A is equals to B inverse, right? That would imply A is equals to B inverse. Okay. Is this possible? That's my question. Is this possible? so we need to make use of the fact that order of any element in g is at most 3 right right can any element in g be of order 3 uh we haven't studied lagrange's theorem yet but i guess i have given the statement of it right i have given the statement of it recall the statement was in this form that if g is a group and any subgroup h is any subgroup of g then the order of h must divide the order of g right so observe that if there exists so i'm not writing these statements out i'm just telling them them out that if um you know any element has order 3 then i get consider the cyclic group generated by that element that will also be of order 3 and that will be a subgroup of g but 3 doesn't divide 4 right so indeed there cannot be any element of order 3 as well what is the only possible order for each non identity element then it must be precisely 2 right 2 is a possible order because you know because there are non identity elements there must be an element of order greater than 1 because order if if you have an element with order equal to 1 then that's exactly the identity element so there must be at least one element which has order greater than 1 there are three such elements none of these elements can have order equal to 4 because that's our hypothesis none of these elements can also have order 3 because you know that that doesn't that is not validated by the lagrange's theorem because again i'm telling if i consider an element which has order 3 when i can form a cyclic group out of it that's also an of order 3 and is a subgroup of g g has order 4 this cyclic group this cyclic subgroup has order 3 but 3 doesn't divide 4 right so it it uh, you know contradicts the lagrange's theorem right so therefore the only possible order of each non identity element is 2 but if that happens therefore so if ab equals to 1 then a equals b inverse but also a is an ordinate non identity element so that implies a must equal a inverse because a squared is 1 but that would imply a equals to b because a inverse equals b inverse and right so you can just again put inverse to both sides but that's also a contradiction because a and b are chosen to be distinct therefore this is also not possible so this is not possible this is not possible this is also not possible so the only possibility comes is ab must equal c okay observe in the in the exact same set of steps we can prove every other possibility that is ba will also equal c similarly bc will equal a and a will equal cb as well and ac will equal b and b uh, so it will also equal ca right the same set of steps will work because in this case if you, if you, if i consider this case then bc won't be equal equal to c because that would imply b is 1 similarly bc won't be equal uh, equal b because then c will uh, c will be equal to 1 so if bc is equals to 1 then b becomes c inverse but b has order 2 so you know so so b again become c but that's also a contradiction so the only possibility for bc to be in this group by closure is it must equal a right observe that all these properties are just the properties of the elements in b4 right 
what were the properties of elements in v4 did consist of properties like uh, elements like this will with with the property that a squared equals to b squared equal to c squared equal to 1 the group is abelian and a b equals c uh, b c equals a a c equals b group is abelian so i'm not writing the other statement so therefore the group structure for g when it does not have an element of order 4 equals the group structure of a four order group which has no element of order did I say the same things twice? Okay. So the group structure of an of an element of order four with no element of order four is exactly equal to the group structure of the client four group. Yeah, this is right. And we know that the basic sense of isomorphism is typically that the group structure is same, or at least we can say that the at least the Cayley table is same. The Cayley table is similar, equivalent. So that precisely speaks of the fact. That G in this case must be isomorphic to B4. So what have we typically used here? We have typically used here two facts. First thing we have, which we have used is that um, Nagarajan's theorem, and we use the fact that uh, you know the the cancellation laws, right? We have just used the cancellation laws, nothing else. So I'll I'll give an exercise that is try and prove the same thing, try and prove the same statement that G is an G is a group with four elements, four distinct elements, three of them are non-identity, which is quite obvious. No element in G has order four. Then just use the cancellation laws, just use the cancellation laws to form the Cayley table of this group. Okay. So therefore, therefore, so we, so what we have essentially proved, we have just proved that D8 mod Z D8 is isomorphic to either Z4 or B4. Now, how can we cancel out the possibility for it to be isomorphic to Z4? If I show that this has no element of order 4, right? and that was the precise thing which we wanted to prove, right? Does this have an element of order 4? Observe that. What, what are the elements here? It's 1 bar, R bar, S bar, R S bar. Right? Observe that R bar squared, that is R, uh, you know, R squared Z, this is equal to Z or 1 Z because R squared is an element in Z. So the order of R bar is 2. Now, S square itself is identity. So, S bar square will also, so it's, it's S square Z, it's, it's also 1 Z. That implies order of S bar is also 2. You can easily observe out, so this is just an easy justification, a one line statement that R S bar squared is also Z. That is, order of R S bar is also 1. Observe from the structure of V4 that every non-identity element had order 2 and that is the same thing which is happening here. Sorry, order 2. Right? Only the identity element has order 1 which is quite obvious. Mm, so, what is the exact part, you know, result out? From? Can it be uh, in isomorphic to Z4? Yeah, it does not have any element of order 4. So, the only possibility is it's, it's isomorphic to V4. Right? Yeah, so it was a bit technical thing to do. These sort of problems, you know, it, it just helps you enhance using the tools, you know, right? Okay. So before ending this lecture, let me just quickly speak about the Lagrange's theorem and a few properties of the Lagrange's theorem. So the Lagrange's theorem. The proof is extremely simple. So, what does it say? Let G be a group. Let G be a group. Let G be a finite group. Okay. And let H be a subgroup of G. Then the order of H divides the order of G. Uh, 
मोर ओवर मोर ओवर दी नंबर ऑफ डिस्टिंक्ट लेफ्ट कोसेट्स डिस्टिंक्ट लेफ्ट कोसेट्स ऑफ एच इन जी which we denote as denoted as uh, this so it's it's typically called the index of h in g so it's typically called the index of h in g the number of left distinct left courses of h in g is typically denoted as the index of h in g okay is precisely is precisely uh, mod g upon mod h now since the quotient group is nothing but this collection of all distinct left courses so if you consider a quotient group then the order of the quotient group or the number of elements in the quotient group will precisely again be this right okay let's prove this proof is quite simple observe that observe that um see we know that Uh, the left cosets partition g right uh, left cosets of uh, you know of h in g so it partitions g it partitions g so if you map uh, if you, if you consider a map from h to g h Such that small h is sent to g h. Then it's it's a well defined map, and it's surjective. Right? It's surjective. So is surjective. Right? Okay. Moreover. Moreover. Suppose. uh you know we consider g g uh, you know g h1 to be equal to g h2 but it obviously follows directly from here by left cancellation that h1 must be equals to h2 right therefore the map from g to g h is bijective now g is a finite group and we have a bijection between two sets so what's the obvious conclusion from here is that the cardinality of both these sets are same which implies the cardinality of h is same as the cardinality of gh where g was an arbitrary element of capital g now let us make use of the fact that g is partitioned by these left cosets we have not just used the fact i just written it here this map is surjective by definition there is nothing to trivial in it. uh nothing to complicate it sorry so now g is a disjoint sum of disjoint union of these g h so you know ranging over g right but since this is a disjoint sum so so you know if i put summation or i should i shouldn't use summation right directly from here so what should be the cardinality of g so it since it's a disjoint sum there's no intersection between each of these elements on the right hand side the the summation happens individually of each of these sets right but how many such elements will be summed up here the number of elements to be summed up here will be exactly equal to the number of distinct left cosets right now order of gh is same as order of h so we have a repetition of elements because the element uh, uh, no Uh, around which this sum is being ranged over is no more uh, you know there in the summation right so what are the number of terms which will be, be which we will be having in this summation it is precisely the index of h in g right because this summation how many elements would be in this disjoint union the number of distinct left cosets so number of elements here will be the number of distinct left cosets so the number of elements here will again be the number of distinct left cosets so it's it's like you know a mod of you know you can you can just bring mod of h outside this summation you're left with just a summation of ones and the number of times this summation will happen is the index of h in g so it's precisely in the index of h in g 
times mod of h cardinality of h to be precise right now obviously the index of h in g is a positive integer at least an integer right so this implies this must divide g and the index is right so let's end this less lecture with a with a with with two slightly important observations okay first thing first if you have infinite groups then it can have subgroups of finite index as well as well as infinite index right because if you consider z so z is an infinite group if you consider subgroup 0 observe that the index of uh, 0 in z is infinite there there are infinitely many left cosets of 0 in z right right what about nz or the you know the subgroup generated by n what is z mod nz z is an abelian group so it's, it's, this is well defined so what is z so so if you recall this is precisely zn isomorphic to zn it's a finite group therefore the index of the cyclic group generated by n in z is of finite index right So let me just state two slightly important observations, direct observations. Observation is in the form that if G is a finite group and X is in G, then the X to the you know power of order of G is 1 for all X in G. How can we prove this? The proof is quite simple in this way. So just choose x to be say an arbitrary element from g. So suppose this. Uh, so g is finite. Therefore, if I choose a sub, you know, if if I choose the cyclic group generated by x, that will also be precisely finite. And if that is finite, so x has a finite order. Okay. So let the order of x be n. And that's precisely finite. But then, uh, you know, since uh, this is the subgroup of G, that means that the order of this subgroup must divide the order of G by Lagrange's theorem. But that would mean the order of X divides the order of G. But we know that if order of X divides the order of G, then X to the power order of G must be one. Recall. If order of some element x divides some element a, then x to the power a must be equal to 1. Right? right. Okay. Uh, the next observation is uh, also kind of very intuitive. No, I shouldn't use the word intuitive. But yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting. That is, groups of prime order are cyclic. Or to make it slightly more you know slightly less intuitive group of groups of prime order are isomorphic to zp isomorphic to zp yeah it's, it's it's like playing with psychology whatever yeah i just i'm just afraid of psychologists uh yeah so yeah it it suffices to show that any group of prime order is cyclic. How do we do that? Let G be a group of prime order. Okay, prime order P. Let X be a non-identity element from G and its existing existence is precise because P is at least greater than or equal to 2. Right. So, so if I choose X to be a non-identity element, consider the subgroup generated by X. Then by Lagrange's theorem, 
the order of h must divide the order of g or uh, order of this must divide the order of g but what are the only factors of g possible it's either 1 or p but that means that the order of x must be precisely 1 or p can it be 1 it cannot it can never be 1 right because x is a non identity element if the order of x order of the cyclic group generated by x is 1 then that means the cyclic group generated by x is trivial but that means x is just 1 right since x is non identity therefore order of x is precisely p but that would mean that the cyclic group generated by x is precisely g but that would mean g is a cyclic group and that will again mean that g is isomorphic to z right okay so let's end this lecture here in the next lecture we will be talking more about normal subgroups in terms of uh, Langrange's theorem and then we will be slowly gradually moving towards the concept of the isomorphism theorems. okay so meet you guys in the next lecture